Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this evening's NAC at Home program. My name is Mitch Case and I'm with the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings, and much more. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you are interested in becoming a member of the NAC or would like more information, please email admissions at the nationalartsclub.org. I'm now going to hand things over to Kristen Burke, co-chair of the club's Young Members Committee. Uh, thank you, Mitch, uh, for that lovely introduction. And it is my true pleasure to welcome our guest for this evening, Sarah Penner. Sarah is the New York Times and international best-selling author of The Lost Apothecary, which has been named one of the most anticipated books of 2021 by Oprah Magazine, Newsweek, Reader's Digest, CNN, and so many more. And I just quickly um, wanted to show everyone the beautiful cover art of the book. I'm sure most of you have seen it already, uh, but I just think it's, it's so stunning and eye-catching. So um, the much too broad summary of the book is that it is about a female apothecary who secretly dispenses poisons to liberate women from the men who have wronged them setting three lives across four centuries on a dangerous collision course. And I think uh, that is just barely scratching the surface of what this book is about. So um, Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. I could not be uh, more excited about your book. I had so much fun uh, reading it. Well, thank you so much, Kristen, for having me. And thank you to Mitch as well and to everyone who's tuning in. I know that we're kind of getting to that point where things are reopening and a lot of us have Zoom fatigue, but I really appreciate everyone who's taking the time to tune in tonight. Absolutely. And maybe before we get into the questions, would you mind reading just a short passage at the beginning of the book to kind of set the stage for our chat tonight? Yes, absolutely. So for anyone who has not read the book, I'm going to read it's about uh, just one page, five paragraphs. And for anyone who has read the book, this will be a little bit of repeat information. But I started the book with Nella. She's the apothecary in the story. And my purpose in writing this chapter, which takes place in 1791, is to really set the mood for the entire story, which is kind of sinister and dark. And this scene takes place at uh, this little shop in a back alleyway in London. So it's kind of haunting in that way. So this will just take me about 60 to 90 seconds and then we'll dive right into questions. So again, this is Nella on February 3rd, 1791. She would come at daybreak, the woman whose letter I held in my hands, the woman whose name I did not yet know. I knew neither her age nor where she lived. I did not know her rank in society nor the dark things of which she dreamed when night fell. She could be a victim or a transgressor, a new wife or a vengeful widow, a nursemaid or a courtesan. But despite all that I did not know, I understood this. The woman knew exactly who she wanted dead. I lifted the blush colored paper illuminated by the dying flame of a single rushed wick candle. I ran my fingers over the ink of her words, imagining what despair brought the woman to seek out someone like me, not just an apothecary, but a murderer, a master of disguise. Her request was simple and straightforward for my mistress's husband with his breakfast, daybreak 4th of February. At once, I drew to mind a middle-aged housemaid called to do the bidding of her mistress. And with an instinct perfected over the last two decades, I knew immediately the remedy most suited to this request, a chicken egg laced with Nux Vomica. The preparation would take mere minutes. The poison was within reach. But for a reason yet unknown to me, something about the letter left me unsettled. It was not the subtle woodsy odor of the parchment, or the way the lower left corner curled forward slightly as though once damp with tears. Instead, the disquiet brood inside of me, 
an intuitive understanding that something must be avoided. Perfect. Uh, thank you for that. That was awesome. And just a quick reminder for everyone listening, if you have questions for Sarah, we're going to leave about 20 minutes for an audience Q&A at the end. So please just type those into the chat box at any point whenever you're feeling inspired, um, and we will get to them later on. So Sarah, uh, I think my, my first question for you is, can you share a little bit about what your background is with writing and kind of what inspired you to create this story in the first place? Yes, absolutely. So um, for anyone who's who's wondering, by the way, I'm tuning in from St. Petersburg, Florida. So still on the East Coast, um, but quite a ways away, Kristen, from where you're at. And to your, to your question about um, kind of how I got into writing and what inspired me to write this story, um, which is probably the most common question that I get, I will start by saying that I have no formal schooling in writing or literature or English of any kind. I actually have a finance background and I graduated from the University of Kansas with a degree in finance and I worked in corporate America for 13 years at two different companies, a large private company in the Midwest and then most recently at Price Waterhouse, which is a large consulting firm. And I uh, just several months ago in March, after 13 years working in finance, I resigned to uh, write full time. So part of why I tell that story is because I'm sure that we have a few writers um, listening in who um, it can be very intimidating feeling like you have to have an MFA or you have to have all of this um, expensive and long term schooling or college classes or something to write a best selling book. But if there's any evidence that that is not at all the case, I'm that person. I actually um, have always liked writing, which is good enough to write a book. Um, all you have to do is just enjoy stringing sentences together to communicate an idea. That's really what writing is. And I've always, since I was a child, liked doing that. And it started kind of with just journaling when I was um, very young. And then in high school and college, I tried my hand at this terrible poetry. And then only in my late 20s did I decide to actually attempt a novel. And I signed up for several online classes where um, essentially every week we had to write a short story or a, a piece of a chapter. And then we would workshop, workshop that with other participants in the class. And that was really all that it took for me to just kind of realize that I was very fulfilled by this. I wanted to try a challenging novel length work of fiction. It's all self-taught. My bookshelves next to me, I've got an entire shelf with craft books um, about just how to tell a story. And even right now, I've got a few of them on my desk because I'm going through a revision. So I'm going back to the basics and reminding myself, how do you approach a, an early revision? So. The learning never stops. And so that's the first, um, that was your first question, Kristen, about just kind of how I got into writing. The second piece of your question about the inspiration for The Lost Apothecary, I wish that I could say I had this wonderful dream or I stumbled on a apothecary vial myself or that there was this really cool and interesting reason why I wrote this book. But the reality is it was a confluence of several ideas that just kind of melded together over time. One of them being that I think this concept of a historical apothecary is really compelling. So very much like the character in my story whose chapter I just read from, I envision apothecaries kind of like a, um, it's, a, it's a predecessor to a modern day pharmacist, but I think of it more in magical terms. And I'm so intrigued by the idea of these shops full of tinctures and little blends that you don't really necessarily know what's in them. And maybe some of them are dangerous or poisonous. So I've always loved the idea of an apothecary. Um, I love old London. I've been to London many times. Um, and then I love the idea of secrets and things that are buried in old places. And the apothecary is a confluence of all of that. So I decided to, to run with that story premise and lo and behold, it, it turned out okay. I love it. Um, the, the characters are so colorful in this book. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that came up for me was, are any of them based on anyone that you know in your real life um, or anyone that you're close to? And if so, who? So I would say um, 
part of why I like fiction, and let me back up a little bit, historical fiction, you can kind of go one of two routes. We see a lot of biographic historical fiction. So you're telling fictional stories about real people. For whatever reason, I am, I can't do that and I don't wanna do that. I like creating complete and total fiction, so much so that my editor, I there's a hotel and a restaurant in The Lost Apothecary and they're completely fictional. They do not exist in London. And my editor even said, can we make these real places? And I was just, I didn't want to. I wanted everything in my story to be completely fictional other than basically the city of London. So to answer your question, are the characters based off of anyone real or anyone that I know? The answer is basically no. Um, I certainly don't know a grieving, aging apothecary. I, I um, the, the 12 year old Eliza, she's yeah. loosely, her inquisitiveness is loosely based off of um, my niece, actually my, my husband's niece, who's, um, she has loved wildlife since she was very young and is extremely intelligent. And so I kind of loosely based Eliza off of her. But then Caroline is very much like me and mm -hmm. how we see London through her eyes and as she explores and sleuths her way around town. That is all very similar to how I felt when I first started going to London and going to the British Library and mudlarking along the River Thames. These are all things that I've done. So I was um, a lot of myself is in her. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, it wasn't in my list of questions, but I was wondering if mudlarking was an actual activity. So that answers that. Yes, it's um, it's funny. I was just chatting with my editor today about the paperback for The Lost Apothecary that comes out next year. And I asked her, I want to put in some cool bonus content. And I asked her if I can do a little introductory guide to mudlarking and she loved it. So that's going to be in the paperback. Um, but anyone can mudlark. I mean, you don't need to be a resident of the UK. You do have to get a permit. You, you pay for a permit and the, they do have planes clothed police that check to ensure you have a permit. And you have to adhere to the rules and make sure you know when the tide comes in and goes out. But it's open to anybody. Awesome. Um, so you, you touched a little bit on Nella and Eliza. So one of the questions that I had was, we see a lot of conflicting emotions from Nella and how she views Eliza in the book. On the one hand, she seems really fond of her. And on the other hand, she seems so wary of letting her in, both physically letting her into the shop and then also metaphorically letting her in emotionally. So can you elaborate a little bit on what drives both of those feelings for her and where those are coming from? Definitely. So I think the relationship between Nella and Eliza is arguably the most nuanced one in the entire book. And it's also my favorite relationship in the entire book because they work through that resistance that you just described. And when Eliza first steps into Nella's shop, um, there's this very brief visual scene in which uh, Eliza runs her finger down the soot in the wall and kind of reveals the unblemished stone beneath it, which for me was very much a metaphor of what she was going to do to Nella's hardened exterior over the course of the book. So mm -hmm. when I think about why Nella was resistant to letting Eliza in, my the number one word that comes to mind for me is protection. I mean, Nella thinks and knows that she's at the end of her life. She probably doesn't feel like she has much to offer anyone at this point. Um, she's obviously growing very physically weary and you can kind of see throughout the story that she knows her end is near. So the thought of developing a relationship with someone so young and pure um, that really has no place in her shop. She's very resistant to that and she wants to protect Eliza. Um, she even tells Eliza in the first third of the story that I'm not the kind of company you want to keep. And she realizes the goodness in Eliza and she wants to keep her safe. But Eliza is so persistent. She, turn, she tends to insert herself into scenarios and situations where she wasn't invited, but she wants in and she wants to be a part of this shop. She wants to help Nella and her persistence ultimately um, not only kind of kicks off the main conflict in the story because she makes a, a very terrible mistake, but she's there to help and she wants to help fix what she did wrong. And at the end, Nella really can't help but soften her heart towards this young woman. Yeah. 
Um, and you do, you paint, you paint Eliza as such a precocious young woman. And I just remember we meet her mother. We only get a glimpse of her mother at the very beginning of the book, but I was wondering if you feel like she inherited a lot of who she is from her mom or if a lot of who Eliza is was just her being a really confident 12 year old. So I think that she, Eliza inherited her personality traits, which are really unique and fun, especially for a girl in that time frame. Not, I, I didn't envision that so much from her mother specifically, but as um, the result of just growing up on a farm and kind of the surroundings that she grew up in, which were so ordinary and very common. And, you know, I was um, kind of telling you earlier how I grew up in the Midwest and then I moved to Florida. I've not done anything as wild as like work my way into a shop of poisons, but it's kind of the same concept. This, I think a lot of us, we grow up in environments and if they just don't bring us a lot of fulfillment or joy, we, in, in our older years, when we have the ability, we work our way out of them and we do something that does bring us joy and fulfillment. And so I, you know, if you put Eliza back um, with those pig pens and helping her mom in the kitchen, I just envision her miserable. Like she's not stimulated enough. She doesn't want to be there. Yeah. Um, which, which to me is less her mother specifically, although her mother did really encourage this idea of magic, um, and more just growing up in kind of an ordinary place, but she's not an ordinary girl. Yeah. Yeah. You make that very clear from the get go. Um, and then for Nella, um, I know we only meet Nella after all of these really awful things have transpired in her life that we learn about later in the book. But I'm wondering, just because I know that you have this like full picture of these characters, I'm wondering what you think she was like when she was younger, like pre-Frederick, and mm -hmm. if you see any parallels between her and Eliza at all. Yeah, so Nella, um, she mentions that when she was a child, her mother taught her all of the things about the shop. So one difference between Nella and Eliza is that Nella didn't really have a choice. This was the family business. This is what she was getting into. Whereas Eliza really wants to be a part of this business and wants to work her way into the shop. So that's one difference. But in terms of just um, the softness of Nella's heart, I mean, she did not have the same baggage pre-Frederick. And when I think about who Nella was, like maybe in her 20s or her late teens, I think of someone who just really wants to be a mother and pass her shop down to her children. Um, and you know, the child that she lost, she states was a girl. So I kind of envision like that's what she had in mind was passing the uh, shop onto this daughter like her mother did for her. So that's a side of Nella that we never really get to see. It's very much a hypothetical to your point, like kind of what's in my brain. And when I think of Nella in her younger, unscarred years, I think of her just wanting to be a mother and have a good shop that's meant to help people and not hurt people. And she's really bitter about the fact that all of those dreams were lost and she took the shop in a different direction. Yeah. Um, so she makes it a point to record the names of all the women who enter her shop. That's a big theme throughout the book. Um, and I just wrote down one quote. So for many of these women, this may be the only place their names are recorded, the only place they will be remembered. There are few places for a woman to leave an indelible mark, but this register preserves them, their names, their memories, their worth. So can you talk about why this is so important to Nella? Like what do these women represent to her? Yes, definitely. In interviews, that's always the line that's quoted the most often. And I think that that makes sense because it's, it's one of the most important, if not the most important sentences in the entire book, because it's why Nella chooses to preserve this register which is essentially a record of all of these murderers th that have walked through her door. And she chooses at the very end uh, not to throw that register away. She doesn't burn it or destroy it, which kind of would make sense to protect the identity of the people within. 
but then she goes back to her core value that you just read and she knows if she destroys that register she has suddenly erased the names of these hundreds of women whose names would not ever be remembered anywhere else and so that brings into focus a bigger question about women's empowerment 200 years ago and over the course of history just generally and how many women and their roles in society have been forgotten or overlooked and one trend that we see in historical fiction a lot today that I absolutely love is how many stories are finally coming to light about women and their role throughout society. Um, whether it's female um, uh, pilots or people who, females who kind of worked behind the scenes in really important movements or wars or what have you, we're finally seeing these stories come to light now, I mentioned earlier that Nella and the people in uh, The Lost Apothecary are fictional. They're not based on real people. But I think the situation is representative of the fact that in 1791, unless you were a member of the monarchy uh, or the wife, perhaps, of um, someone very famous or well-known, your name simply would not be recorded. And I kind of pity, no, I don't kind of pity, I definitely feel bad when I think about 200 years ago, all of the cool, important women that lived that we will never know about because their names didn't get recorded anywhere. So Nella's trying to change that, um, that destiny for them. Yeah. Um, so that brings me to another question about what the, I guess, intention of the novel was for you. I, I've read a lot of interviews and I've heard you speak about it. It's very much so categorized as a feminist novel. And it just got me wondering, like, did you set out to write a feminist novel or did it just sort of like come about that way as you were developing the characters? So I will say that I knew from the very origination of the story premise that this was going to be a story about women. I did not set out with a feminist agenda. And in fact, I got a little bit nervous when the book was finished and there was, there was press and publicity starting to come out categorizing it as feminist because I thought, oh gosh, we might've just opened up a can of worms here. Now, don't get me wrong, like I embrace that categorization, but it just kind of brings up a lot of things you need to think about and it can be a little more abrasive um, and open up discussions that you don't anticipate. So, but honestly, now I'm just like, I own that. <laughs> and yeah. in many ways it is feminist. It's giving women in 1791 at least, the control and the ability to do things that they couldn't have otherwise done. And they're they're in a bad situation and this is how they're choosing to deal with it. And one of the things, so I said, when I set out to write this book, I wanted to write a book about women. One of the most interesting for me aspects of writing this dual timeline story with the past and the present is to show how the two narratives are similar and then how they're dissimilar. So. Um, starting with the dissimilar, in 1791, these women who were suffering like from infidelity or betrayal or what have you, they, they were resorting to poison in my story. But then when we go to the present narrative, we see Caroline handling her own situation with her marriage and her career in a much more healthy way. She um, is choosing to go back to school. And I don't want to give away too many spoilers, which I, I apologize if I've done already, but she chooses to handle her dissatisfaction in a productive, healthy way. Yes. And I wouldn't say that poisoning your husband is necessarily the, the healthy, productive way, but it's what happens in the story. So that's how they're different. But then if you look at how they're similar, they're all, all of these women are dealing with problems in 200 years from now, all women will be dealing with the same sort of problems, whether it's trust, um, betrayal by friends or spouses, dissatisfied with our employment or our chosen profession. Um, we That will not go away. That is a consistent theme so long as humanity exists. And so when I set out to tell a story about women, that was the really interesting exploration for me was what's different and what's the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's more of a statement than it is a question, but I also don't want to give too much away. And at the same time, I'd love to hear you just talk about it. One of the things that I loved so much about this book was the James character, actually, because I feel like so oftentimes 
characters like that are like immediately villains, right? When when they do what James has done in the book. And that didn't really seem to be the case for him, or at least from my perspective, that wasn't how you wanted to paint him. Um, so like for myself, I thought for a fleeting moment, they potentially might have a shot, you know, when he like goes to London and they have the reunion and all that. So I'm wondering if you can, um, if you can talk about whether or not that was intentional. Um, and if it was like how that gives maybe more color to Caroline's journey, that he's not just like so obviously a terrible guy. Yeah, definitely. So I can tell that you, you very closely read the book. And um, the reason I say that is because the relationship between Caroline and James evolved. And I think there are um, from my first draft until the, what you have read now in print, and there are clues about that evolution that I think are still in the book that people like you have picked up on. And you're not the first to say that there are brief elements of their marriage or things that they see about James that they do briefly, their heart goes out to him a little bit and they wonder if someday there might be a happy ending. So to explain that a little bit more, when I first drafted the book, I mean, before I was agented, before my editor had ever seen the story, um, James had, he was not nearly as villainous as he is now. So um, some of the things, the decisions that come to light later in the story around his manipulation, those did not exist in my first draft. And I actually originally, um, when the book was just my own, I kind of envisioned more of a possible happy ending for Caroline and James than we see today in the story. Oh, yeah, which now it's a little bit gray. And I don't ever, the story is my own, so I don't want to imply that anyone made me change the story. However, um, I, I was getting a lot of um, feedback that, it's, it seemed uh, more authentic uh, to the story if I really drew out James's manipulation and so of Caroline. And so uh, that was what I did as the author. And there are, but I think there are still little uh, clues in there and soft uh, bits of softness for James's character. And I think, you know, I purposely left the resolution of their marriage gray. Mm. Caroline is taking a step that's going to help her with her own self-exploration. James, when, when he expresses kind of his remorse at, through a couple of junctures in the story, I view that as mostly, mostly true. I, I don't think he's just lying through his teeth. So I imagine them after the story kind of working on themselves, which I think we all need to do in our marriages. We all need to keep working on ourselves. Um, and some people have asked me, like, do they get back together? You know, what happens after the story ends? And I don't really have an answer for that. I haven't gone that far. I didn't take the story that far. Um, but I think that the door is certainly not closed. I think people change throughout their lives and we all make mistakes. And sometimes we choose to forgive and sometimes we choose not to for a variety of reasons life and marriage are just gray. And so, um, you know, James is not all bad. Yeah. Yes. Um, I love that. Life is not black and white. It's mostly gray. Um, right. Totally agreed. So I think it also makes the decision that Caroline makes towards the end of the book that much braver, right? That he isn't this so obviously terrible guy because it would have been a lot easier to say goodbye to him if he was, but um she obviously you know shows up as a hero in that way because of it what do you think um nella would say to caroline i know we're we're merging centuries here but if nella could give caroline advice if they hypothetically lived in the same century what do you think she would say about her situation given what she's seen yeah i would say um i think that nella would tell her you know don't do anything permanent so nella is the women who come into shot into nella's shop to buy this poison nella is not telling them go kill this guy these women have made up their mind what they want to do they're going to do it one way or another and nella is the most disguised and convenient and, and secure way to do that um, so, but I think if Nella, because I don't view Nella as a villain and I never have, I've always viewed her as a helper of women. And so I think if Caroline sat down with her, Nella would say like, we don't need to go into my poison shop. Why don't you just take, 
take some time, figure out if you still love this guy, like all of the things that Caroline ultimately does do in the healthy, productive way. I think Nella would uh, absolutely support that. Cool. Um, so switching gears a little bit, I wanted to read a quote about Caroline and Gaynor's relationship, which I think is another really special component of the book. <laughs> I'd approached Gaynor, a total stranger, with nothing but a glass vial in my pocket, a glass vial and a question. Now I stood before her again, bearing almost no semblance to that person. I was still grieving, yes, but I'd uncovered so much about myself, enough to propel me in another direction altogether, a direction I felt I was meant to pursue long ago. Um, I love it because I think it so nicely sums up the relationship that these two women have and develop so quickly, you know, in the grand scheme of things. So um, that made me wonder if you have had any women kind of like a gainer in your life that have propelled you forward or just made you think of yourself or look at yourself a little bit differently than maybe other people have in the past. Yeah, so there's a few different thoughts that I have on that. Um, you mentioned how quickly uh, this whole book unfolds, and, and that includes the relationship between Caroline and Gaynor. And I was just talking to um, a group last night about thrillers in general, and I consider The Lost Apothecary thriller-esque. Everything happens really fast, and most chapters end on a cliffhanger there's often a uh, kind of a ticking clock to speed things along or just a really compressed time frame. And I had a lot that needed to happen to Caroline in basically six days. And one of them is her ability to make fast friends. But I don't think that that's not authentic. And the reason I say that is we all have met people that it's like we spend a couple hours with them, maybe at a work event or something like that. And we leave and we exchange phone numbers and it's like, I feel like I've known this person for years. And sometimes these friendships do happen really fast and really naturally. And that's what I envisioned happening between yeah. Caroline and Gaynor. Now, whether, um, to, to answer your question, like about, is there someone specific that I was kind of drawing that relationship on? What's interesting is when I was thinking of Gaynor, I was actually imagining the so many countless helpful, librarians and researchers that have helped me at different points in my life. And even today, um, when I say today, I don't mean like as in June 22nd, but just present day, there are so many different uh, resource hiccups that I encounter working on my next project. And I just go to, I um, go onto the website for my library and most libraries have a little ask a librarian chat thing. It's not a bot. There's actually generally someone, a librarian talking through there. And they have helped me find the most obscure and interesting and useful information. And then when I've gone in person to libraries as well, like the British Library, for example, that, it, that these people are so helpful. This is what they do for their job is they love pulling old documents and helping you find hard to find information. Um, and then the last thing I'll say on that point is the name Gaynor, her name was actually, it, it, it changed. Um, mm -hmm. I had an early reader, again, like a very helpful, enthusiastic woman who read an early draft of the first few chapters and she loved it so much. She like emailed me probably half a dozen times about how much she loved this book. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to rename this character in, in her honor. And this woman's name was also Gaynor. And so I think when I think of Gaynor as a character, I just feel so warm inside yes. because she represents so many helpful, enthusiastic people that I've just encountered in my life and in my work. And I believe in fast friendships. And I don't believe that, you know, you need to spend years with a person to call them a good or close friend. I think sometimes, especially in adulthood, when it's hard to make good friends, these things can happen really fast. And um, so Gaynor represents so many just things that I believe and love. Oh yeah. I mean, when she calls her to the hospital and you, there's that moment when she's like, is she gonna show up for me? You know, right. physically, and then is she gonna show up in the way that I need her to as a friend? Um, and then she does in so many ways. So I just thought that was such a special uh, dynamic that you developed in the book. Um, Speaking of, so I personally feel like I could watch a whole other um, TV series. I know the book is being developed into a show for Fox 
on Caroline at Cambridge and her other discoveries in London and her friendship with, with Gaynor. Um, can you share any information about that or is all of it still kind of proprietary? Like when can we expect the show? And um... So the, the news release that's on deadline publicly available is about all that I know. And I'm not just saying that. Um, that was pretty much what I was told too. So the, uh, you know, the book industry is a black box anyways. And then you add on the film and TV side and it's even harder to figure out what's going on. And all of these announcements take forever to come out. I actually learned about the Fox thing in October, I believe, and it was just announced in June. So I was just sitting on that information for about seven months. Um, but that, that press release really has everything that I know. Um, I won't, you know, people are asking me, will I get a say in casting decisions? And I won't. Um, they, they still need a producer and a writer. So there are a lot of steps that need to happen and a lot of hoops that need to be jumped through in order for the um, series to actually go into production. But I cross my fingers every day that my film agent would call and say, we're, we're a go, this is happening. Here's our producer, here's our director. Um, and I'm a consultant on the project. So I would love the opportunity to kind of go through some herbal remedies and disguised poisons and things that I have in mind that didn't make it into the book. But um, we'll see. I, I definitely have to cross one bridge at a time. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, that actually brings up another question. I know you have a personal interest in uh, essential oils and herbs and plants. So how much of the knowledge that you deploy in the book was knowledge that you already had just from this passion? And then how much research did you have to do um, to make all of this stuff that Nella had going on sound believable? Yeah, I would say 95% um, of the remedies and the, the disguised dispensing methods that you see in the story was research or imagination. And 5% was existing knowledge that I had. Um, so at the end of the book, there are several recipes and one of them is a bug bite balm. I, that was all, um, that's something, you know, I live in Florida, I think I mentioned, and we have a lot of mosquitoes, lots of bug bites. So I have been making that um, little tincture for years and all of my family asks for it. Like it's very effective. So I highly recommend that for bug bites. Um, but most of the most of the things in the book were research. So my shelf, I have tons of resources on different toxic plants and poisons and um, just how things are made up, like what chemicals, what symptoms. If you ingest one of these poisons, how long it takes to display in your body. Um, there are so many different um, interesting ways to disguise poisons. And some of them I did just with my imagination, I, I kind of came up with. So one of the things, for instance, is wolf's bane. And um, that is truly a, a root. Um, and they used to extract this poison from the root and put it on, this is in the book, but they would put it on arrows and then they would hunt wolves and the poison would kill the wolves. Uh, but I read that the the root is uh, very similar to horseradish. So I thought, well, like maybe a horseradish sauce, like that would make sense. And apparently Wolfsbane is also very bitter if you taste it. So it was things like that. I just kind of tried to use common sense, like however the poison was described in its most pure or raw form, I would then try and translate that into if I were an apothecary trying to poison, some, poison someone, how would I have disguised it? Very impressive, <laughs> very impressive. Um, I'm curious who your own writing inspirations are. I know, I think I read that you are a big Elizabeth Gilbert fan. Mm -hmm. um, is there anyone else that you would kind of source as uh, inspiration for either this book or just your writing in general? Yeah, so you mentioned Elizabeth Gilbert. She's She's been kind of a creative um, inspiration for me. I'll give a couple of examples um, of different authors on and very, I have a very eclectic reading taste, I feel like. So I first got into historical fiction by reading Philippa Gregory and Ken Follett. 
totally different authors, um, but but really in Elizabeth Kostova, she wrote The Historian as well. And her book, um, The Historian actually opens with this character kind of finding this interesting letter in a book. And I love that. That's about my favorite story opening to any book is finding something mysterious or a clue and then going on this, um, it's like treasure hunt. So those are a few historical fiction authors I like. I also, on the more commercial side, I love Fiona Davis. We share the same literary agent. And before I was ever published, I decided, like, I think Fiona Davis is kind of my similar in style to my writing in that it's very accessible historical fiction, um, kind of almost feels modern. If you compare it, for instance, to Ken Follett, which is like very dense and heavy historical fiction. Um, I also love, um, I love Wilkie Collins. He was an 18th century, or I'm sorry, 19th century um, mystery writer in um, London, I believe, kind of like um, Charles Dickens. I mean, he yeah. really, really cool um, in-depth mysteries. So I love him. Um, Ira Levin, I, I like, um, I'm, I actually recently gave my mom Rosemary's Baby, which is his most well-known um, book. And I just love how he uses only a few words to get across a really powerful idea. So those are a few of my inspirations. I could keep going. This whole shelf is like full of some of my favorite authors. Um, once a year, I try and read uh, something by Shakespeare and I love the puzzle of how he writes and tells, um, you know, tells just these brief snippets of a story and trying to kind of untangle and reorder the words and to see what he, what he was trying to say. Yeah. Do you have a favorite um, Shakespeare play? Um, I mean, I guess I'm partial to Romeo and Juliet, but part of why I say that is because I saw it like I was sitting in the third row by myself in London. This was maybe six years ago. Um, a couple of the actors that are no longer even um, doing it. I think one of them was in Game of Thrones I, in Lily James. Um, she oh, was yeah. the actress. Um, so that would that was probably my favorite. Amazing. Um, perfect. I have so many other questions. I could sit here and talk to you forever, but I want to open it up to audience Q and A. Um, so let me start with these. Um, all right. Kathleen E asks, so how did you come to choose finance as a major, uh, when you had the childhood passion to string sentences together? That's such a great question, Kathleen. Thank you. So, you know, at the end of the day, I was in college and I wanted a degree that I knew would offer job security and um, pay the bills. That's not to say I hate math. I actually have always had a very natural aptitude for math and my favorite class in college was calculus. Um, so I've always really liked math and data and analysis, and um, I knew that finance would always uh, put, a, put a good job on the table for me. So that said, we can only deny our real passions for so long. And after working for a few years in finance, which is all very left brain activity, I knew that there was something missing and that kind of right brain, creative, imaginative side. So that was when I decided to enroll in the writing classes. Perfect. Um, Marie Harper, given Sarah's newness to the field of writing, has she settled into a writing routine? So yeah, thank you, Marie. So I will say this, it seems new because my debut just came out in March, um, but I've been writing seriously since 2015. So about six years, I wrote a my first project, I haven't mentioned this yet, my very first novel length um, project was rejected by 130 agents. And this was back like 2015, 2016. Uh, so I definitely have experienced the rejection that we often hear authors talk about. In The Lost Apothecary was my second attempt, and it 
thankfully was not rejected. It, it was, um, I had five agents offer on that manuscript. And so of course it's my debut novel, but I will say over the last six years, I have written and worked on my manuscripts more days than I have not. So, um, but it's interesting because to your point, so many people, this they're just now discovering me, you know, my debut's only been out for three and a half months. So it's, I'm definitely new to the scene, but I, I also have been writing a lot, um, you know, on my own for much longer. Um, and following up on that question, can you talk a little bit about how you were able to secure an agent? Question from Erica. Yes. So um, I could talk for hours about the querying and the agent experience. Um, what I would do here is direct you um, to my website where I have a couple of different features on how I got my agent. That's literally um, what I what it's called. And um, some of the different tools that I use to research agents and identify agents. Um, that's all there. But I will say, just at a, um, at a high level, I definitely did my due diligence on, so I mentioned Fiona Davis. When I kind of identified her and I was a fan as a reader first, uh, at the back of every book, basically in the acknowledgements, authors list their agents. And so I immediately made note of Stephanie Lieberman. She's in New York um, at Jane Clow and Nesbitt. And um, she was one of the agents, uh, of course, that I queried in my first batch. And then ultimately she made an offer on it. So there are very there are entire classes and sessions on how to find an agent but i will say that for me my personal experience i went to comparable titles where i felt like the lost apothecary would fit on a bookshelf next to these other titles and um, looked up the agents that those authors had did some research to make sure i'd be comfortable and then took it from there can you talk a little bit about what is on your writing horizon? Another question from Marie Harper. Yes. And before I do that, I will say I saw my, yep, there we go. My website a second ago was missing the H on the Sarah, but that's correct. Um, Kristen, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Um, yes. What is on Sarah's writing horizon? What's on my writing horizon? Yes. So I am working on the next thing. However, I mentioned that the industry likes people to sit on information for entirely too long before it's public. So my next project hasn't been announced yet, which means I really can't share a whole lot of detail. But what I can share um, is that it takes place in an atmospheric historical setting, uh, very much like the Lost Apothecary, although not the same era. There are plenty of cliffhangers and twists, which is my favorite type of book to write. I mentioned earlier, The Lost Apothecary is kind of thriller-esque and very fast-paced. That's that's where I kind of have my sweet spot. So this next book is in line with that. Um, again, it's a story about women who are brave and rebelli rebellious. Uh, it will definitely probably be marketed as a feminist novel, just like The Lost Apothecary. And the last thing I'll say is, in this industry, there's something known as speculative fiction, which is where the characters and the readers are questioning what's reality versus what's not. And in The Lost Apothecary, that took the form of magical realism. So throughout the book, you're kind of asking yourself, was that magic or did that actually happen? And Eliza is asking that question too. There are different forms of speculative fiction. And in my next project, there is a different form of asking that question, uh, what's real versus what's illusion. And that will be explored in my next book. So I think, you know, if you walked into a bookstore in 10 years, The Lost Apothecary and my sophomore novel would be situated very close to one another. It's not about an apothecary, but they have enough similar themes that I think my existing readership will be very happy. I can speak for the group, I think, when I say we cannot wait. <laughs> um, I love this question from Uma. Are you surprised that revenge slash murder story, in this case, elicited this much response? You know, I'm not surprised because readers who pick up a fiction story are ready for literally anything. And I think a lot of authors actually play it safe. So I can't tell you how many books I pick up 
and I put them down and I'm like 80% satisfied, but I just wish that it had gone a little bit further. Like it'd been a little crazier and that the ride had been a little bit wilder. So, um, I think that poison and revenge, you know, so many of us dream about what would I have done in 1791 if this guy ticked me off? Like, would I have gone to Nella's shop or would I have not? So part of fiction is we get to play with these hypothetical scenarios and ask ourselves how we might handle a situation that the character is finding him or herself in. So you can be brave and bold. I mean, no one's dying in real life. So um, I'm not surprised that that Poison and Revenge, you know, got readers really excited. Yeah. Um, consumers love murder. I feel like yes. that's, that's just a given. Um, so another question, what libraries, archives, and collections did Sarah use for her historical research? Yeah, so I would actually have to go to like my uh, bookmarks on my internet, and I don't want to kind of do that and navigate while I'm on camera. But um, the one thing that is really interesting to me is, and you can't really Google it, because like Gaynor says in, um, in the story, Google algorithms are not really made for real serious research. But once you kind of find, um, like the British Library, for instance, if you go to their website, they have a collection where you can see their digitized manuscripts. And you can kind of dig into something that you think is interesting and then look at the metadata and it would, will tell you like possibly where that originated from. And maybe it's some obscure library in Scotland. And then you go to that website and you sort of like, it's literally like just looking for breadcrumbs. So you wouldn't necessarily go to Google and find it there. You have to kind of start with a place and move backwards. Um, one really helpful resource, whether you're writing historical fiction or you're just interested in it is the, the um, books that you get to do some of your research, flip to the back and look at the bibliography and look at what resources that author or researcher or historian used. And that's a really good starting point. Um, I actually have this firsthand journal from 1775, uh, this um, midwife and apothecary surgeon it was actually a man. And I found out about this firsthand journal in the bibliography of another book about apothecaries and medicine in the 18th century. So you just kind of have to work backwards and look for these um, breadcrumbs and honestly stay off of Google. You're not going to find what you need on Google. Um, but these bibliographies, like once you once you kind of get that first breadcrumb, you can go down rabbit holes for days. I love Marie says, I get the research work, Sarah. I've been an archival librarian for five years. Right. Yep. <laughs> um, so I I want to make sure we leave time for any more questions, but um, I do have one more. You dedicate the book to your parents. And yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role that your parents have played in your writing career. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not asked that question often, um, but I love that question. So uh, my dad passed away in 2015. We were very close and he was a defense attorney, had been published in several literary journals and always was a very strong orator and speaker and writer. And then on my mom's side, um, she too, her, her side of the family, her dad, for instance, he had written a couple of books and was the first judge on Guam. So both sides of my family have always kind of had this um, interest and aptitude and strength in writing. And although I didn't really, um, you know, it's not like I sat with my grandparents when I was young and learned how to write from them, but I feel like maybe there is some passed down, whether it's genetic or something else, there's some passed down quality that I do always feel like maybe I got from both sides, whether it's an interest or a skill or what have you in writing. Um, so when I, you know, when I set out to think about the dedication for the lost apothecary, which is the very beginning, you know, you're dedicating it to, to whomever. And for me, it was my parents. Um, and then at the end, you're also acknowledging all of the people that have helped you. And they say that the last person in your acknowledgements is always the most important. Mm. It's kind of, a, you know, a joke in the industry, but I thought it's it a lot of pressure too, right? It's so much pressure. Yes. Um, 
It's so much pressure. But I thought this just wraps it up perfectly. Like this is my debut novel. Unfortunately, my my father who passed is not here to see it. And that's really disappointing. There's no way around that reality. But my mom is and we're really close. And so that's something to be grateful for. So for me, it just made sense to kind of put my parents at the beginning and at the end and everything in between is like all sort of a result of just the love and the life lessons that they've both shown me. So um, I think with my next book, though, you know, I'm very happily married to my husband, Mark. And I think uh, he maybe he'll be the last in the acknowledgments and also my dedication. So we'll give him maybe book two. That's beautiful. That's really I think that's a, a perfect note to end on, actually. Um, Sarah, thank you so much. This was such a delight. Uh, I so enjoyed talking to you and the book is fantastic. Thank you so much again for joining us. Yes, thank you so much, Kristen, for having me and thank you um, for all of the questions. And I'm not hard to find on social media if anyone had a question that they didn't want to ask or were too shy. Um, I'm all over social media. My website's very easy to find and I'd love to hear from anyone. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Have a lovely evening wherever you are um, and we'll see you soon. Thank you again. Great.